Today I'm explaining the difference between defensive medicine and negative defensive medicine in healthcare economics. And this includes an explanation of the economic reasons why doctors might have an incentive to avoid complex patients. And this is just one of the factors that we might want to consider if we're thinking about what are the factors that drive up healthcare costs or drive down healthcare quality. All right, definitions first. Defensive medicine is going to be when doctors increase the amount of healthcare they're providing patients to avoid lawsuits. So for example, this might be when they order a bunch of tests that are not really necessary, or maybe they do procedures that the patient probably doesn't need. And there's almost always a little bit of risk that goes along with doing these procedures, but they do that because they're afraid if they don't do that, they're going to be sued. Negative defensive medicine, on the other hand, is when doctors intentionally avoid certain types of patients in order to avoid lawsuits or other types of negative consequences like bad report card scores or low pay for performance measures, things like that. They avoid the sickest patients or the most complex patients because they fear what could happen, such as a lawsuit or a bad score, if something goes wrong when treating those patients. So just to be clear, one of them is doing more care, the other is avoiding certain types of patients. Now, a couple of things I wanna say about defensive medicine. Defensive medicine is something that is very salient to doctors. A lot of doctors will claim that this is a factor, it's motivating behavior. And of course, economists want to see evidence. We want to see when we look at the laws that, for example, put damage caps on the amount that patients can sue doctors for, does that impact um, the amount of tests that are ordered, does it impact health, all that stuff. And there are a number of high quality studies that have been done by economists that look pretty carefully at these laws and they find different results depending on the setting and depending on the illness they're looking at. Are they looking at heart attacks? Are they looking at childbirth? And I might, I might have another video at some point explaining that literature, but there's basically mixed findings for defensive medicine. Does it happen? Does it increase costs in healthcare because the doctors are ordering all these tests? There's some evidence of that, yeah. But, but most of this research is looking at damage cap laws or laws that are related to the lawsuits where patients sue doctors. I personally think it's not so much the dollar amount you're going to be sued for or things that happen in the courts that, that drive this behavior. To some degree, um, what is salient to doctors is the relationship between the doctors and the patients and the amount of blame they get from their peers in the hospital, other doctors, from nurses, how much do their patients respect them, how much do their peers respect them. All of that stuff matters a lot for doctors. It's the squishy stuff that's not easily measured and it's not all of a sudden changed in a law that we can study as economists. And I have a feeling that it's these squishy factors of respect and fear of blame and all that stuff that probably drives a lot of this behavior. And that's going to make it a lot harder to study, a lot harder to even quantify or say anything about. But we as economists need to get much better at dealing with that emotional relational side of things because if we care about incentives, which is what economists care about, that's what really drives behavior. So my personal belief is that defensive medicine is a bigger deal than we have measured as economists and that doctors are correct when they say that defensive medicine is a real factor in the decisions they make, even if we as economists have not found evidence that is absolutely conclusive about the existence or the magnitude of defensive medicine. All right, so that's defensive medicine. What about negative defensive medicine? This one is not talked about as much, but I think it's really important. This is the factor that if a doctor is worried about the consequences if something goes wrong on the surgical table, the doctor may say, you know what, I'm only going to take really simple patients that don't have a bunch of chronic illnesses, that don't have complicated home lives, complicated socioeconomic lives, because all of those factors are risk factors in terms of a bad outcome for the patient after they leave the surgery table. So if you want your scores, for example, your report card scores, your pay for performance scores, um, 
even just sort of like how well perceived you are by the nurses and the other doctors in the hospital, you want to make sure you don't have a lot of negative stories about you. And to avoid the negative stories, you don't want patients with a lot of complications who end up back in the hospital. Readmissions are something that hospitals get penalized for. If you want to avoid that, don't take on really complicated patients. And to some degree, this is actually rational, and in a lot of cases, it's what we would want the doctors to do. However, what it also means is that patients who are more complicated, who have a lot of secondary conditions, who have complicated home lives or a lack of social support, or all these factors, they're less likely to receive the care. And that's an equitability issue. All decisions about whether to do a procedure are going to involve risks and benefits. And ideally what we would want is for the doctor and the patient to look together at the risks and the benefits and to decide together, do the benefits outweigh the risks? If we're thinking about negative defensive medicine, the doctor's fear about consequences to their own reputation or their own financial score or whatever, or their own chance of being sued, are going to weigh the risks too heavily when they see that the patient has characteristics that are likely to increase those risks. And negative defensive medicine is a pretty subtle concept, but it's one that we really need to think about if we're thinking about what are the potential perverse incentives in the healthcare sector. Now, there's all kinds of complications with this. For example, um, if you're a new doctor who's not very experienced and you encounter a really complex patient, you might want to say, actually, I don't have the expertise to do well with a patient like you. You should go down the street to the doctor who has tons of experience and can treat you with 30 years of knowledge behind them that's gonna help them manage everything that's going on with you. So that would actually be a good thing to happen in medicine, channeling the complex patients towards the doctors who are best at treating those patients. The problem is, what that would mean is that these doctors who had all this experience and who were known to be good at handling these weird complex cases, those doctors would look like they're doing horribly because they take on all these risky cases, all these complicated cases, Maybe they do better than anyone could do with those patients, but since those patients have a higher rate of complication, a higher rate of hospital readmission, a higher rate of even death on the surgery table, that doctor might look like a really bad doctor. And so if this doctor with all this experience wants to actually do the right thing, they have to be willing to accept the consequences of looking like they're doing the wrong thing. And so imagine this from the doctor's perspective. Let's say you have a year and you're, not, you're just making good decisions based on weighing costs and benefits to the best of your ability. And at the end of the year, let's say you get a bad score on a report card. Um, someone from the government comes in and they say, we've scored all of the doctors based on the complication rate for their patients and how many of their patients get hospitalized, all that stuff. They say, we are rating you as a bad doctor because of your score. The doctor is going to be like, whoa, this isn't fair. I'm just taking on really complex patients. And if there's a huge consequence to them for that, if they get a 20% pay cut, or if they get sort of shamed at the medical conferences, or if they get dirty looks from the nurses, they might say, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm not gonna take as many complex patients next year because this isn't fair to me. So for complex patients, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not the right doctor for you. Go down the hall to that other doctor. They'll be better at treating you. And if you can just send off 20% of your most complicated patients and then make room for a few more healthier, less complicated patients to come in your door, you can probably improve your score. But that's not good for the healthcare system. It's not good for the equitability of patients. So. Negative defensive medicine is something we need to think more about. It's, it's a fascinating topic, and we, we do talk a lot in the medical world about defensive medicine. Negative defensive medicine should be just as forefront on people's minds when they're analyzing healthcare policy.